Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another. Now, I say this every time, a fantastic episode. But today is truly an episode that, that is dear to my heart because I, I am a super fan of our guest. He is an amazing, I mean, I'm going to say it, legendary. My pop culture upbringing involved this man in so many ways, movies, TV, so many things. I, there's one movie that I quoted him nonstop to the point where like people were just yelling at me, just quit it. And such a super fan, such a, an amazing uh, performer. And uh, before I get to our guest, let me introduce uh, my co-host, Foti Stamos. Hi, Foti. Well, where's my introduction? No, you, you, you have no introduction anywhere near that. Sorry. <laughs> wow. No, no. I, you know what? I, I'm equally, equally excited. And I'm going to double down on everything you just said about our guests. But uh, everything's great here out in Boston. Awesome. Awesome. And then we have all the way on the other side of the country, another, another guy who, who's a performer and who I have major respect for. His name, in case you don't know, Angelo Tsarukas. Hello, Angelo. Hello, Forte. Hello, Adi. That's true. <coughs> How are you, my friend? I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in a Montreal state of mind, so I put Montreal in the background today. Good for you. Good for you. And, um, and, and there's another reason why I did that today. Uh, respect to Canada. And I know Adi, when I, when I said to Adi, the guest we're going to bring, and he goes, you know him? And I said, I do. <laughs> and he was like, wow. And, uh, and what I'm going to say, uh, uh, I have to admit, uh, uh, the, uh, our guest has been in films a lot. There's a lot of stuff here we can cover. <laughs> and he's a, a alumni from Second City, which is a, 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 he's got a comedy background and he's a, a, a great actor. Uh, I'm not going to give you all the things he's done because there's so many here. Yeah, I mean, we don't I, have all night. Work with Tom Hanks. He's been there on Seinfeld. He's been uh, Forever Night. There, uh, there, there's a lot. And then, of course, we're going to get to the John Hughes, the iconic <sighs> <clears throat> and all the other stuff. And he comes <clears throat> originally from London, Ontario, Canada. And he makes his home in Los Angeles. <clears throat> I got a little frog in my throat. Welcome to Connecting Greece. Welcome, John Capellos. Good to have you here, John. Welcome to our show. Welcome, so you John. Guys, you guys don't have all night? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I do. I, I actually have all night, John. I will stay on as long as you're down. <laughs> uh, John, normally I... So, John, good to have you. You look great. Uh, it's been a pandemic. It's been... You know, we've been going through a shit show for and a year. The Greek word. And, and, and just up. <laughs> I, 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 how do you say shit show in Greek? Uh, skato. <laughs> skato. 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 <laughs> yeah, right. it's a, uh, no, skato uh, parastasi would yep. be in Greek, right? That too. <laughs> and and here's, a, here's the best part, just to update everybody what's going on. So in California, we have the, we had the worst amount of COVID. And now we are the forefront. We're ahead of it so much that we're going to open. And Canada today shut down for a month. Yeah. I don't know if you heard this, John. Canada's completely shut down. They're closing the borders. And I don't know what happened. Canada was way ahead of the story. But anyway, we, we wish all our best to uh, our friends and family in Canada. And I got, you know, I got, when, I, when, I first, when I first moved to L.A. Uh, about 16 years ago, I got to go to the, uh, one of the Greek film festivals and I saw uh, uh, John, I saw you and I, I had to go and say hi to you. And I went up to you and you couldn't be nicer. And we've hung out a few times and you got a great sense of humor and the, the work you've done. And when I told, and you know, John, when I told Adi and I'm going to let Adi go, when I said that we we're going to bring you on, uh, Adi got excited and recently, and, and I'm going to start with this because a friend of mine has a t-shirt. And I know the story to this, but I don't. I want everybody else there. And the T-shirt says, "She's into Malakis, Dino, mm -hmm. right? She's into Malakis, right?" <laughs> and that's a iconic thing. And John, tell us the story about that because you you have a lot to do with that line, if I if I remember correctly, right? On the First John all, Hughes thing, in contravention of some universal uh, copyright <laughs> thing, right there. Sure. <laughs> well, careful. Um, Basically, uh, when we were doing that scene, um, we shot that scene here in LA. It was a big uh, studio. We were shooting at Universal. And John Hughes said to me, um, <laughs> a 
I mean, I, we're like I was the Greek owner of this black bar, and he said, uh, <laughs> "I forget exactly how it came about." He, but we were tossing about for words that that I could use, and and I threw out Malacca. I pitched him the word Malacca, and he asked me what it was, and I told him, and uh, basically that it was a Greek jag off, <laughs> and, and sort of in Chicago yeah. terms, and uh, the rest is sort of film history. My mother fucking hated it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, I got a lot of a lot of grief for that. She was really seriously unhappy with it. I mean, for the most part, she was pretty enamored with what I did. But um, this oh. one is, is something with it. She said, "Why would you choose that word and everything like that?" But um, oh, anyway. that that I mean that that was classic. When I was doing my intro, that's the line that I always like. I was you know younger little kid, and I would quote that nonstop. I thought it was the the most brilliant thing in the world to hear Greek in a mainstream movie in the eighties. I mean, these movies that you were in, um, and I want to ask you uh, about uh, uh, the John Hughes stuff. But um, mm -hmm. these movies you were in, were, I mean, these were huge. These were culture, like for for our our age group, they were like. I mean, there was nothing bigger. When we saw these movies, we would go to school, we'd be all excited, and we'd be like, talking about it. We'd be like quoting these, and the Shizinta the, Malakas. I was like, that's Greek. He speaks Greek. That's a Greek actor. That's a Greek actor. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you grow up? Uh, Boston. Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Boston? Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually connected in a small area, but it's called Somerville. It's right next to Cambridge, which you probably mm -hmm. heard of, Harvard, MIT, all that stuff. Yeah. My mother was born in Chelsea and raised in Watertown. So. What? Oh, wow. So, um, no I'm, way. I, know, I know Boston fairly well. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, there's a good connection, guys. I didn't know, I didn't know that, John. Yeah, I didn't know that. My brother at went all. to Harvard, and my aunt, my aunts, all my family, my family, my, my great uncles had a, a spa called the uh, Pembroke Spa on, on uh, Mass Ave and uh, Pembroke Avenue. I mean, oh, wow. you know. John, I mean, that's and very close. In, and my, my grandmother lived in uh, Brookline. And, oh, my uh, God. That's where my family, my, my mother's family is from. My, fam my father was born in Greece and then came to Canada when he was very young, when he was 11. And my uncle, his brother, older brother, was born in Greece but came to Canada. But a convoluted story because in those days, a lot of times people would come over, like my grandfather came over and lived in Chicago. Yeah. My grandmother came to visit him, and on the way back to Greece, my <laughs> grand, my uncle was born, and you know, then the rest of the kids were born back in Greece. So one of those stories. That's um, that's incredible. I I I actually well, did not know that, and that's why he's so cool, Angelo, because he has roots in Boston. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And then, but he has that kind sensitivity from Canada. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's an odd mix. My fam, my. Boston family is, um, you know, I mean, it's it's pretty deep. My my grandfather, who I'm named after, came over to Boston in the 1880s, 85, and he had a oh wow, he was a chocolate guy. All these guys were in the chocolate business oh. and, and confection business, and he, uh, you know, was in that business. So you know, John, I I uh, there's got to be a lot of Capellos in the Boston area because I went to high school with a John Capellos back in the. Uh, mid eight late 80s so Wait, now, oh. now which one did you, where'd you go to school so i grew up in rosendale and i went to yeah, west well, that's, my, that's my cousin john yeah i know john he oh lives in uh, suburban dc now and yeah I, I i lost track after high school but i did go to high school with a john capella well, those are my cousins my aunt fanny capellas owned a, a um a, owned a, a a brew house in harvard square i mean they, oh, had, wow. a, they, they had a bar in harvard square yeah, these are my dad's second cousins. Okay. And, um, you know, wow. I never really got close to them. I mean, I keep in touch with them and some of them, uh, but uh, most of my uh, Capella's family is in Canada. Like, uh, Ange probably knows this, that my um, uh, my uh, cousin's daughter, uh, Vashi's now on CBC TV, and she's a big anchor type on CBC. Oh, cool. She has a big show in Canada on CBC. Yeah, she does a, a political show. She's really good. Power and politics. It's a daily show, and you know she interviews all the the prime minister, etc. And 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 we're very proud of her. And like my cousin's family is mostly in Toronto and like that. But oh, I'm wow. talking too much. 
this really is connecting Greeks, isn't it? <laughs> that we got, you guys, I'm just sitting back now and it's finding out. Oh, and it's so, but John, I got to ask you. But you know, the thing about Greeks, honestly, is it's all these little villages. I mean, growing up as I did in London, Ontario, and I hear about Detroit and Chicago and Buffalo and Toronto and Hamilton and Guelph. And I mean, and then you'd hear about somebody who lived in, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Bronxville, New York, or, yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera. What were we going to say, Ange? No, I was going to say, uh, it's interesting how, you know, because when you started off, it's funny because, bless you. Bless you. Thank I, you. It's, it's, it's funny starting off in entertainment business because, you know, it, it's, the amount, your body of work speaks for itself. And I was so happy because, you know, guys, about, I think two or three years, about three years ago, um, the movie, uh, The Shape of Water, which won Best Picture. And John uh, uh, played uh, the the manager. You played an Armenian care, uh, man who runs the theater. Yeah, Remember the theater where they're at? The landlord. And that film won Best Picture, Best Academy Awards with Guillermo del Toro. What a great uh and I was so happy. My wife's Armenian, and when you you played an Armenian, and I know you played many characters, of of course, Greek based, Italian, Armenian, regular, uh, regular wasp, whatever, well, honk. regular. <laughs> I say regular now. I know be white people are regular, no, regular. now. It's not even it's awesome. You you play, you're not a regular guy, <laughs> and and it's so funny because it's so funny that, but <clears throat> what I found interesting. Did you find John because you like know, I'm a stand-up background? I know you come from a improv background, and you were from, you you were in Chicago at the fame famed Second City. So, uh, did you find John? Did you did you did you find from that? Uh, did you derive because of course acting comes after, but improv uh, is something, especially at Second City. What was that experience like, and how did that move your career uh, after being in Chicago? Well, improv to me just gives you the freedom to speak and to be able to speak in a character. I mean, for me, I mean, you're a very funny stand-up and that's what you do. And always the differentiation in Second City, I mean, it sounds a bit wonky and then talking about comedy is a little bit like talking about swimming, I'd rather do it, but- um, Yeah. <laughs> or sex or whatever, but um, in this case, we're talking about acting. Um, the, the, the thing is that for me, it's really, a guy like you says funny things and a guy like me says things funny. And that's the difference. I like that. Yeah. And, you know, you have a, you have things that you say that are really fucking so sensationally funny. And whereas um, I'm best, I think, when I'm locked in a wheelhouse or in a wheelhouse of a character where I can play around and, and then that gives me the parameters of doing something if I'm playing you know, I grew up, you know, imitating my uncles and my cousins and everybody, hmm. everybody around me to great effect. And then when I started pissing them off, I realized I was hitting close. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, as a teenager, there were certain relatives that stopped talking to me because of the way I made fun of them. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> and then that just happened. <clears throat> and like my uncle would really, I skated a lot with him. And like, you know, uh, they always say that you make fun of what you love and sometimes what you hate and sometimes what you love and hate is kind of the same thing. <laughs> um, particularly if it's your mother or your father because as a Greek kid, you know, I love my mother, I hate my mother. I was, you know, you're always <laughs> vacillating between these emotions of uh, extreme emotions. And also that's just the way it is growing up. And um, in, in Bernie at Second City, what they taught us is to make fun of your own. You know, don't make fun of the other. Um, you know, don't victimize other people. Victimize yourself, yeah. <laughs> or, or at least, or at least, you know, the the funny situations in Second City is when you're laughing at a scene and you go, "Oh God, that guy with that woman is like what an asshole." And you look at ways you're behaving. You know who he reminds me of? He reminds me of me. <laughs> and, and that's when it's that's when it's the funniest is when it's self-revelatory. And you're not pointing at other people going, look at that asshole, you know, with the big ass, or look at that person over there. You know, you know that big ass person is me. You know, I'm the big ass family for guy. And and mm. it's more funny. It's funnier and much more fun and exciting, ultimately, if you can laugh at yourself. Because I don't know about you guys, but my parents um, got through a lot of stuff. Both of them went through the Depression, et cetera, and the war and all that stuff. Yeah. 
and had gallows humor, you know. The, I worked with this actor several years ago, this old guy, I forget his name now, but, and at the end of the day, he said to me, you know, John, there are two types of people in this world. And I go, oh no, he said, this guy's <laughs> gonna come out with the most anti-Semitic <laughs> thing in the world. And I go, okay, what type, two types of people guys? Those with a sense of humor and those without. Yeah. And I thought, you know, if you're gonna crack the world into two, that is a good place to start. And I found growing up, for the most part, there were people that could take it and people that couldn't, you know? And so true. And sometimes, you know, even in my, with my relationship, I, I give out a good as I get. And then she gives me stuff back and all of a sudden, like I'm getting the same stuff and I'm not taking it. I was like, ha ah, ah, ha ah. ha. So you've got to be able to take it too, you know? <laughs> At the same and, time. But you know, John, you make a good point because I've always said this, especially when it comes to comedy. And I find Greeks, and you, you hit it on the head. But the thing is, Greeks like to make fun of people but don't like to be made fun of, <laughs> right? I, I had, I, I, when I was in Chicago at Second City, I had a very, very, very negative interaction with the Greek community. Wow. And um, I have to say, guys, honestly, I'm not a Greek's Greek guy. I mean, yeah. I've always skated on the edge of the community. I was a bit of a hippie growing up. Uh, I was never the good Greek boy that, you know, <laughs> they would talk about John Capellos. John Capellos, he had a cigarette the other day at the London Cafe. <laughs> you know, I would shit in a restaurant. I'd come home and there'd be a doctor there looking at my arms, waiting to see if I was a heroin addict. No kidding. <laughs> I mean, I had experiences with my parents. My parents were so straight. There was one time I came home and they had a doctor waiting there. Oh because they God. saw me having a cigarette downtown, London, Ontario. And when I got home, my mother had a family doctor who said, can he look at your arms? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're laughing now. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's very traumatic, but it's now sort of, it's funny. It's it's funny. Cool. It's like, I mean, it's you, know, you can. And like, you know, they were so far off that the problem is my parents were just so, you know, we were yeah. smoking pot and smoking hash and fucking Led Zeppelin. We weren't shooting heroin yeah, for yeah, yeah. I mean for God's sake they were they were they were so square it was funny you know yeah right uh, but yeah I think we all share that kind of experience like if 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 my parents knew half the stuff I was doing they would have freaked out but now I look back I'm like it was no big deal but you know and then least, again I grew up with I have friends and people that I know that had parents who were drug addicts and and you know like <laughs> thank God my parents were like yeah you know, solid over the hill, <laughs> <laughs> truly, who are really in love with one another, couldn't get any daylight between them. I mean, they made decisions. There was never ever trying to separate them in any argument. So, so was there a point that you said, mom, dad, I wanna be an actor? Was it like something like that? Or was it something that gradually happened to you? And they just kinda, you're like, oh, I'm gonna be on this show and blah, blah, blah. Well, in retrospect, I mean, you know, the sort of the thumbnail sketches and I'm the youngest of three and my brother and sister uh, are incredibly overly achieving academically and my father pushed us all academically. And, mm -hmm. Excuse me, my, at the end of the day, my, my brother and sister kind of, in my opinion, did everything that my parents wanted them, us, any children's to, children to do. So I said, well, I'm gonna try this. And my, do my dad, when I told him I wanted to be an actor, when I was around, what, 19 or 20, no, maybe 20, um, 20 years old, 2021, 20, I dropped out of university. And um, it's a long story that I've told us several times, but for the most part, what happened was I told him I wanted to be an actor and he was, he was pretty cool in a lot of ways. He mm -hmm. said, and I'll be honest, he said, you know, you're good looking, do something with your looks. <laughs> And, and he said, you know, you're smart. He said, I'd prefer you be a lawyer. He wanted me to go to law school. He said, you'd be, you'd be a hell of a lawyer. But he was sweet about it. You know, he said, you know, uh, don't be too smart on the way you, you know, don't be too cocky. But if you want to act, uh, you know, uh, I'll give you a year. And uh, that was really kind of him. I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'll take a year. And he said, if after a year you don't get a job, it was really, you know, complimentary because he'd seen me in a couple of high school plays and, you know, he knew that I had a bit of a, an attitude and panache and it was, you know, 
I think back on it, he wasn't that uncool about it, but he said, listen, you do it for a year. And if, and if after a year, you don't get it, something. But then he said to me something that I think was more, more fundamental. He said, listen, when your mother and I went to New York a few years ago and we, you know, every waiter, every bartender was yeah. an actor. Yeah. He said, if you're going to get a job, if you're going to be an actor, get a job acting. So that's what made me sort of look around and look at Second City and say, okay, well, they're paying you. you know, so at that time, they were paying $20, $25 a, a gig, but that was $25. Yeah. They were paying you, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's how I got into that. And that's another uh, historia. That, that's, that's actually like very cool. I mean, you know, as Greeks, we've heard stories of so many people and how they got into what they're doing. That's actually very cool of your dad to not, you know, just be like, you're not going to be an actor, blah, blah, blah. In he, retrospect, I think what he was smart at or he was wise at is that he didn't, he knew me enough to know that he wasn't, he had to bargain with me. If mm -hmm. he said, no, you're not going to do this, I would have, we were kind of estranged for about seven, eight months before that. So mm -hmm. we hadn't really been talking much. And so that wasn't a pleasant experience for either one of us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are certain types of people that can really, keep anger well neither my yeah. father and I could it would be better for us to be getting along than not getting along yeah yeah so there was too much uh you know uh what's the word um the Greek word uh, uh um I'm blanking on it now but anyway there's just too much uh grinia, that's the word oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good word I love that word <laughs> keep it up in the air and so we figured that out and and then, you know, the fact of the matter is, and my father died in 1980, so before I actually got into the movie. Oh, wow. So, so he never really saw me in any of the films and stuff. Oh, man, because I, I was so going to just ask, like, how did he feel when you, like, were on in these, like, epic movies that, like, were, like, culturally, like, huge. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, I'm sorry. And John, I, before you, I want to add to that. So, you know, John... Because it's interesting that it sounds to me like what your father was saying a lot was that you know if you're going to do it like be good at it. I think the yeah. Greeks are well, more. That was also. I think that's a that's a sorry, but that that's a bit of a cliche that my I think that well if you're going to do it be the best. I right. mean that was really, you know, and, and we make fun of it, but you know my brother sister and I, um, my dad wouldn't say good night, have a good night's sleep and everything. All right, good night. Remember, the key to success is work, W-O-R-K. <laughs> Every effing night, he'd say that. Yeah. So it wasn't, and he was kind of a, a weird hybrid because he was in the Canadian Air Force. So when he came over when he was 11, 12 years old, so his Canadianness was very kind of, you know, get up in the morning and, you know, brace yourself, you know, put the cold water in your face and go out and do your, you know, there was kind of, kind of a little bit of, Royal Canadian Air Force, 1941. <laughs> right. He's a military uh, man. Yeah. And, you know, we love that about him. And I also think that um, he was a realist in that, you know, um, a lot of parents, uh, you know, they, a lot of the kids that I grew up with had what I would call astronaut parents. Their parents were like, you know, really younger and, yeah, you know, they'd come up in these sleeker cars and <laughs> they'd all be, you know, having parties on Friday nights and, and then it ended up, I found out that all these parents were having affairs and this and that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, like, sometimes when you're in the moment, you're like, oh, my God, my old school Greek parents are so lame. They're so this, so, so that. But then you get older and you see the reality of what happened with other people. And then you, you build, like, all that much more respect for your parents and, and what they actually did like in your 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 upbringing and yeah. i think you know a lot of a lot of greeks have that story and, I, and it sounds like you have that story too and it's really cool like i have so much respect for for in a lot of ways it's like oh my god i hated my mom my dad so many times but now in my age i'm like you know, they well, you really know I, I say this and i say this with love but my mother was a cop and <laughs> i would come home at midnight i mean we would have strict curfews and I was, you know, I, I smoked cigarettes for the most part and uh, and uh, would have drinks, beers and this and that. And she'd, she'd inspect my hands. She'd... <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, you know what? She cares. She cares about her son. I mean, maybe she could have done it a different way, but in the, in the end, 
it's it's about her caring. Well, I get for the you. same treatment now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of asking you about the first time your dad, and again, I'm sorry that he wasn't alive to see what what you've yeah. accomplished. How about your mom? The first time you were like on the big screen. Well, my mother's a different story. She's kind of. Um, she uh, loved it and uh, she loved all the movies. Uh, her favorite movie, I think, was Roxanne. And she <laughs> yeah. didn't like when I swore. And she said, I sometimes mumbled in the movies. <laughs> I spoke a little too quickly and I could enunciate a little bit better. <laughs> the first movie I did was 16 Candles. And I think my first line was, the guys that thought we had to get married, but I think we were feel a pretty stupid. What was it? <laughs> guys, the guys that, it was, a, it was a hard line to say. And I had to say, <laughs> The guys that think we, I'm at the altar and I go, I bet the guys that thought we had to get married feel pretty stupid right about now, huh, Padre? <laughs> I, I remember that. I think that's the line. I guess, guess the guys that thought we had to get married feel pretty stupid right about now, huh, Padre? <laughs> she says something about how she's having her period. Yeah. Right? So, and I had to say that line, and I had to say it real fast, and then Hughes <laughs> wanted her with a bit of a laugh and an attitude. So, I guess the line is, right, I feel, guess the guys that thought I had to get married feel pretty stupid right about now, huh, Padre? <laughs> now, that's a mouthful, right? Yeah. My family was like, that line, what was that? Guess the guys had to about Padre? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> guess the guys had to see about now right about by Padre? So, you know, it's like, it's not enough I'm in the fucking movie. Let me you. I mean, I mean, the, I my mother that. was very, very like enunciate. Like, but, but I mean, are they aware that like you know, being in a movie is very, very structured. Everything is planned out. Everything is very. One like, of my family members asked me once, like, "Why didn't you apply to get into a Spike Lee movie?" <laughs> I said, "Apply to get in a Spike Lee movie." Apply. Like, an application <laughs> I make out. So, John, you had a great relationship. Obviously, John Hughes loved you because he had you in all those uh, ro those great roles that everybody knows you from. I mean, it's not, that, you're not just defined by the John Hughes films because oh, you, you work with Steve Martin, you work with Tom <laughs> Hanks. But the reality, when you played Carl the janitor in Breakfast Club. Oh, man. That was, to me, if you want to end up like me? I mean, I, I mean, for I think it was... Uh, the. So many people, I still watch that movie. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and, and that was the whole idea of, you know, Molly Ringwald and uh, uh, not Judd Apatow, Judd, uh, Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson and uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony Michael Hall, <laughs> Ali Estevez, and Ali Sheedy. You know, and they're in the school and I have Bender. I got, I, I'm watching you guys, you know, and, and he's, <laughs> you still know like weird science. Uh, Breakfast Club, a uh, sixteen these, candles, a fucking movie. These, these, these about, are for. These about are it, for I say this, I say this quite often, but I think it's true. You know, when I was growing up in the '60s, I mean, you know, just the the click before, we had forty five records, and that's why I know songs. I hear a song on the radio, and it's like, oh my goodness, it's like so much in terms of like. And like we used to play music over and over. You guys had VHS tapes yeah. and or beta tapes. And I think the generation that, so that stuff was, you know, when I watched a movie in like 1967, that was it. You never got to see it again because yeah. it disappeared. Right. Uh, and, but then you get to see movies that's like, oh, you can videotape it and this and that. So I think that had a huge thing to do with the cultural ability of Hughes to be sort of played and replayed and played and replayed and, and, and sort of that. Thing. And also kind of the, the whole, I hate to use the, the word, but zeitgeist of, you know, kids going to school. I mean, for me, I mean, I sound like an old fart now, but I just <laughs> never forget that day in February 1964 when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan and that Monday morning, yeah. all yeah. we were talking about was the Beatles. Yeah, and, yeah. All, and I was in third grade and that's all we were talking about or grade three in Canada. And so here you go. Um, with the, the, the thing about those movies, and also, you know, you're not talking about Porky's. You're not nope. talking about uh, some other really shit films from the 80s. You're talking about some other film. You're talking about these films because Hughes, quite simply, cut to the quick, never talked down to teenagers. Yes, yes. He just, he, you know, the teenagers, 
And in a sense, the Hughes adults in the movies were kind of like the adults in the Charlie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wah, 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 wah. Charlie Brown. Wah, wah, yeah, they were kind of. <laughs> And like, if they were real characters, they're kind of obtuse and kind of like, yeah. Oh, pardon me, guys. <laughs> My allergies, whatever. Yeah, today was bad. Today was really bad. It's bad because of the weather here in LA. <laughs> anyway, um... now, John, when you worked on, because uh, you played uh, Jerry's accountant on Seinfeld. Oh my God, classic. The classic. And they think you're a drug addict, right? And I, I've, I just saw it recently. <laughs> And you, because you pop up a lot. I mean, when you're when you've done as much work as you've done, you pop up in films and you pop up in uh, television series and stuff. But what was that experience? Because we have a mutual friend with Fred Stoller. Remember, we did his podcast. <laughs> and me and John did Fred's podcast. Goes, oh, Freddie, um, yeah. Goes, Angel, Fred Stoller, do you yeah. know Fred? Uh, do you know John Capello? Yeah. yeah. It's Fred, <laughs> Fred Stoller. He's funny. <laughs> not from it's not from New York. It's not from New York. Um, that's how we talked. Yeah, it's awesome. Did, 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 did. Well, the funny thing about Seinfeld basically was like it was. I think it was a Thursday that they asked me to. You know, in them days, you would get a fax. So I <laughs> got you know like at noon or something. I get a call from my agent. We're gonna fax you over the sides. Can you get over to MTM Radford, which is CBS Radford, right? Yeah. And um. Uh, they want you to read for this Seinfeld. And I had really long hair. What was left of my hair was long. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had sort of grown it and it was sort of my my unemployment hair. <laughs> so I go over there at like 3, 2.30 in the afternoon with the, the sides, uh, the crinkly paper sides and go in an audition. And um, they come out, I come out of the audition and they say, go sit over here. And then they come out about five minutes later and says, can you uh, wait for, can you hang for a network read through at five o'clock? At which point I knew that I got the gig. I said, yeah. I said, we're going to talk to your agent. Boom, boom, boom. So that's how it happened. Boom, I was in. Wow. And then we started rehearsing the next day and then we shot the next Friday. So the, you know how they do these things. You do network reader. I don't know whether you do know how they do these things. Yeah, but. I don't, I don't. <laughs> I've been in a couple, but not, not as many as you, John. But by yeah, but I mean, the standard format for these sitcoms is you rehearse, you rehearse, and at a certain point in the afternoon, all the suits come in, they sit in the, the thing, and you do a read-through. It's, it's kind of a ridiculous charade, frankly. Yeah. And then they give notes, and everybody talks after, and at 11 o'clock that night, in the old days, they'd throw a script at your door, and now they PDF you a script, and they go, you know, we've rewritten the thing, and then you come in the next day and re-rehearse. And then you shoot, you were do that until like the Friday, and then you do it in front of a couple of live audiences, who they excruciatingly keep over time. And but you know, yeah, honestly, it's so cool because there's a I'm lot. A fan, I'm not a fan of the sitcom, frankly. I mean, I don't. Well, I guess, you've been you've been in a you've been in a, you know many right. You've been Home not, Improvement. Not I I've been in films and stuff. I mean, the, the, I've been in Home Improvement and Seinfeld and this and that. But the sitcom form is. Um, Especially when you're a guest star and you come in, it's kind of unforgiving. Oh, really? If you're yeah. if you're a regular on a sitcom, it's a much better better gig. Oh, that's interesting. But I was yeah. going to say, it's like I mean, it, it there's a lot of character actors that like do like guest spots here and there, but like you literally have been like in these classic scenes. I mean, that Seinfeld scene, I'm, I'm not the, the episode, but like the scene with like him with a cigarette in his mouth and like drink it like that's just such a classic like i think of that scene all the time it was a it was a lucky moment i mean <laughs> uh it was a very fortunate moment because um i was told by uh what's his name um you know curb your enthusiasm um, larry david larry david said john whatever you do do not break up because we you know michael's gonna do stuff you just have no idea we have no idea I wouldn't have been able to do that. <laughs> um, well, um, again, I tell this story a fair bit, but the truth of the matter is, um, I think the cameras were all downstage left to me and Michael was here right to me. So what I did <laughs> was I, I had put my inside right cheek between my teeth and I just bit down <laughs> and uh, kept myself. So you can see, if you watch it sometimes, you can see my my chin flex a little bit because what I'm doing is biting down on my inside cheek <laughs> to not fucking laugh. 
Yeah. And um, that night when I went home, I'd like taken a chunk out of my cheek. But, <laughs> but Michael Richards, uh, I loved working with him. I, I thought this guy. Yeah. And, you know, I really felt sad when that whole yeah, yeah, yeah. thing happened several years ago. Yeah. 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 Because um, didn't deserve it. I mean, it, it, it. It doesn't reflect him as a person. It reflects him in a moment. You know, that's the way I see it. Stupid choice. And it was. I saw you at the Laugh Factory when I was on stage. My friend was hosting the show that night. And I guess he just had a bad night. But yeah, he, he, every, he, now everybody's got their phones out now, right? That's so the they're, thing. They're recording you all the time now. So it lives on well, forever. I mean, this is a really, every night at Second City, I worked on in the main stage for five, six years. I forget exactly. I, I, my brother and I did the math. I did it's like 12,000 shows or whatever. the for oh, wow. But I mean, I toured for three years. We, when we did suggestions every night, we take occupations and uh, famous sayings and this and that. And invariably, invariably, on any given night, we would get either one or both of these suggestions, abortion and cancer. Every fucking, really? every fucking night. <laughs> occupation, <crazy>. abortionist, <laughs> uh, you know, cancer. You know, can we have a, a, something you might face in your life? Can and invariably, the two, the third rails of comedy, you cannot do anything, right? Yeah. I mean, and I'm not kidding you guys. I mean, you ask any improv group and you go out on any night in front of any audience, you're going to get either one or both of those suggestions. If oh, you were long enough. It's the weirdness <laughs> of the audience, right? So my last night at Second City, and we never do a scene about abortion or cancer. So my last night at Second City you get to choose any scene you want to do in the improv set because it's your last night and you're the big star and you're saying goodbye to John Capellas or whatever, or John Capellas, whatever, whatever we're <laughs> going to say. It. So um, uh, I'm in Second City and I say, okay, uh, this is my last night. I said, first scene, call it AC. AC, what's that? It's, it's, it's based on two of your suggestions. Just put AC up, right? So um, we begin the scene and there's a man pacing the floor, right? Lights come up, hospital waiting room, man pacing the floor. Door opens, guy comes in with a white suit. He goes, oh, and man goes, oh, Dr. McKinnon. Is everything okay? And the man goes, doctor goes, yes, just want to let you know, Mr. Magnatis, that uh, the abortion was successful, but the baby would have died anyway because it had cancer. <laughs> Oh my God. We took out the lights and the audience <laughs> booed and hissed for about three, four minutes, right? Like, oh, ooh. based on two of your suggestions. And the lights came up and I'm standing stage and I said, listen, I've worked here for eight years and every night I get those suggestions. Don't you ever suggest them. Those were based on your suggestions. And, but you, you were able to do make a skit out of it. You wanted to, that was your swan song. That was my one of my swan songs. But I mean, but sometimes with the Greeks, uh, I did this thing uh, where I was supposed to show up at a fundraiser, and I showed up in character. And I go, this Mr. John Capellos, he a big actor. And I had my head shot and everything, and I was dressed, and I, part I, I had hair then. <laughs> and I did this comb over and I put on this really bad suit and I patted myself out and I go, my, you know, mid, I, my name is Nikos Manasiotis and I represent the Ajapa Club of Caparelli, Greece. And this John Caparelli is a shame. He comes out, he says, God damn it, he makes fun of the Greek people. And there were this, this talk, it was a live <laughs> phone in um, fundraiser on television, right? And they didn't know what to do. And they thought I was really pissed off. <laughs> I ripped up my headshot and I said, never go to Second City to see him. He is not funny. He is bad for the Greeks. He says this and that. <laughs> and I left and they were so upset. And then they realized that I had punked them as I guess yeah, as yeah. it became known as. <laughs> they you know, John, you do that too well. <laughs> <You're Yeah. thinking. laughs> it's perfect. Well, but the Greeks, I mean, the Greeks really hate being made fun of. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, trust me. I put, listen, I put one of my skits up, John, on YouTube. 
And I, I swear to God, they're writing things. Rejodro Malaka. <laughs> <laughs> you fat Malaka making fun. You American Canadian Guruni. They just. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking laugh. Oh my, God. I think it's, my friend goes, don't you get mad? I go, it's hilarious because they don't get it. It's a joke. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Like, comedy is comedy. And comedy offends sometimes. <laughs> comedy, you know, makes you uncomfortable. And oh, fuck. You, at least you guys can, can take that and, and, and roll with it, which shows that you, you also have a good sense of humor. And emotional maturity, uh, I think, would be a good uh, a description, right? I mean, we, we all grew up making fun of each other, right? As Greeks, you know... Yes, yeah, but Forty, you're right. But when you, John's right when you, when you do something, even a character, like, <laughs> I was, I'm still laughing. At this I can't. Thing. When you, when you do something like that, they get irate. They, I mean, they, they still get mad. Like my uncle, why don't you go get a job, bro? Go get a job. I go have a job. Go get a job, bro. Well, you don't want me to get a fucking job. I have one. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh but John, my gosh. You, you play, you were in a film that I really liked and it was a gem uh, with, the film was called Nothing in Common with mm -hmm. um, Jackie Gleason and Tom Hanks. I've talked about that film. It's about a relationship between a father and a son, right? And yeah. it was early in Tom Hanks' career. And yeah, he does, just done, I think, bachelor party or something so right. he was just yeah. you know i mean one forgets that uh both robin williams and tom hanks were these guys that kind of broke the mold in so far as you didn't come out of sitcoms and become movie stars in them days right yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah yeah and and uh you know both of them of course exceeded you know their wildest expectations blah blah but um tom tom um and Gary Marshall, that was a great experience. Tom is, right. is Tom's a phenomenal guy, period, period. Is there, is, let me ask you, is, was, has there ever been a, a time, because this happens, I know, was, was there ever something <clears throat> that you uh, unexpectedly stumbled into and were pleasantly surprised by the result? You know, sometimes you go to read for something and then they give you something else to read and then it's like, oh, I didn't expect this. That which happens, some you know, when you walk into a room, they see you and they go, Oh no, he's the detective or he's the judge or whatever. Has it ever happened in your career? Where because I'm sure people are going to be asking, you know, you like I know that you you come from the school of being prepared, right? So if they sometimes you go in to read for something and then they go and then they, you know, the, the guys are talking and Dirt goes, Um, hey. John, we, we have a better role for you to do. Well, I did two two parts in a movie many, many years ago called Head Office, and that happened spontaneously. And that was kind of fun. That was a movie that Ken Finkelman directed. Right. Um, and uh, with Judge Reinhold and Rick Moranis. And oh. uh, it's got a hell of a cast. Eddie Albert. Uh, um, uh, it's 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 not a it's kind of an uneven even movie, but in a, in a sense, it's sort of about corporate big business. It's a little bit of ahead of its time. Um, and I played two parts in that quite spontaneously. Um, uh, one of the more fun casting experiences I had was when I read for the movie Roxanne. I read for a lot of different huh. parts. And right. then I read, uh, then one of the more pleasant casting experiences I had where I never got cast in the damn movie was I read for like 10 parts in Midnight Ex uh, uh, Come on, John. Um, with, uh, come on, John, with De Niro and... Uh, Oh, Midnight uh, Run. Midnight Run. Oh, yeah. Midnight Run with Charles Grodin. I'm going to say Midnight Express. That's harsh. No, no, no. <laughs> it's okay, John. It's okay. We all, have, we all suffer from COVID brain. All of us. Don't worry about it. No, Midnight, uh, midnight Run. And yeah. I read, I spent, to the extent of which I spent a day with De Niro reading about three parts. Wow. And that was a thrill because Robert De Niro was the reason I got into acting, period. Oh, wow. I, mean, I just loved the guy. And, and What a uh, great film. With Charles so Grodin, and I sadly didn't, you know, do it. And I reread uh, Charles Grodin's uh, showbiz biography recently, and he sounded like he had a difficult time doing the movie. <laughs> De Niro, uh, De, Niro at that take, De Niro takes his stunts and stuff very seriously, but he's a he's a sweet man, Mr. De Niro. Um, 
difficult as far as incredible. Well, I mean, your 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 resume is so huge. Like, I would imagine, like, you never lost a part ever because, I, I how do you have time to well, be? Well, I lose a lot of parts. <laughs> I probably, uh, you know, get twenty percent of what I auditioned for. Wow. That's, that's pretty good. And that's pretty good, actually, because it's funny. A lot of people think uh, the success is your tenacity and, and your talent. But I think what a lot of people, you know, guys, what they don't realize sometimes is that, like, I mean, being with uh, De Niro all day in that film, I mean, there's many times you don't know why. It's not even about your uh, your talent. Yeah. Or yeah. sometimes it's about your look. And I mean, when you when I saw, like, recently... I saw, you know, it's so weird. So I, I was in Australia and I'm at, at the hotel about three years ago and I see you it know, like that. It's a real country. It's a real country. You know, I say this now, John, because it's like, it's part of the Commonwealth. And, 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 and I saw an episode of forever night that you were in. And it was like, because in those countries, you know, a lot of the shows, that we don't maybe see anymore. They're being shown in South Africa and in Sweden <laughs> and those other places, right? So if I ever see a friend of mine, I always I want to call them up and say, by the way, I... Well, it's I like when I went to Greece it. in 1970 and I saw Mannix and it was dubbed, you know, Peggy Lipton, uh, his black secretary was speaking in perfect Greek. And I, <laughs> <laughs> when did she learn how to speak Greek? I was so naive. It's like, oh, she speaks Greek. And, and Manix was such a great show too. I see it on uh, I hear it Comfort TV. It's on the on the um. The, but I mean, how how like for okay? So Fati and I we're we're not performers. We're not actors. We're we're nowhere near that. So you and Angelo, we're, we're bullshit artists. Yeah. <laughs> so you and Angelo, like, how does it feel? I mean, this is directed to you, John. Like, how does it feel that like? There's probably not one place on earth that like somebody has not seen you in something like whether it's like going to the movies or 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 like late at night they're flipping through the channels and you're like on this show or like just like somewhere somehow you're connected to so much in 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 people's popular cultural like 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 no, life it's, it's like it's all amazing. i have to say is i want to keep on doing it is you know God um, bless you. the thing is you just want to keep on working i mean i'm i i am uh i'm proud of it i love it it's uh i have i certainly uh you know um you know i'm certainly it's what i want and what i wanted i mean everybody wants to be in the film world i mean you asked me about the let's say the breakfast club or something and like the fact of the matter is that john hughes made a wrote a great character and is sort of the shoe fit yeah. um, can i ask you very quickly um so did you just meet john hughes in an audition and then he took a shine to you or did you guys know each other or like how did how did it come about that you were in as far as i know three john hughes movies and three I huge actually, john i was hughes. actually in four i was four. in ferris bueller but we cut out the sequence oh interesting yeah. i didn't know that and then uh yeah, no, it was as you said it. I met him and he took a shine to me. We, I did an audition and, uh, uh, you know, there were a couple of things that were going on with John is that he really wanted to make films, right? Mm -hmm. And he had a nice fat check from Hollywood and they really were putting a lot of money behind him and he had worked at Lampoon and yeah, yeah. he had a huge vote of confidence. But the other thing is he wanted to make films in Chicago. Yeah. So he embraced Chicago performers he embraced the culture, he embraced the Midwest. Yeah. You know, if anything at that time, I mean, the one thing Chicago is, it's not New York and it's not Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, Boston like had the proposition, but New York, um, New York is a really stuck up place. It's a lot it's more small minded than one would realize in terms of the theater and other mm -hmm. things. Just quite frankly, it's a wonderful Broadway and this and that, but. Chicago is a place where people actually really supported a place like Second City. But now things have changed, apparently, because Second City has been sold, but that's another story. But you know, so for us to, uh, Hughes really sort of embraced that Midwestern ethic. He was from Detroit. And, um, like thinking back on it, like, and, and I can't even imagine a John Hughes movie 
not associated with Chicago. It's just like standard now for, for at this point, thinking back all these years, it's like John Hughes, Chicago, and John Capellos is going to be a character in here. Well, the thing is with John is that, um, again, I mean, I just think that he, uh, I mean, I'm revisiting the same thing. He just didn't talk down to the, the yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, the, these were these were iconic movies. If you think of '80s, like the, you, there's a handful of movies. It's true, and it's true. And I, I challenge anybody in the world to think of '80s movies and not have a John Hughes movie as one of those '80s movies. No, I mean, and that's, you know, and they can't take that away from me. And you know, yeah. uh, and and the, you know, not to get sentimental or sad about it, but I wish my father had seen it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's good. It's good to have success. Um, you know, it's in itself. It's not a. It's it, it, it's it's what you do with it, right? It's what you yeah. Do with it. Hey, John. Do you think it's? I think you're from the school. Is it better to be uh, famous or to keep working? Oh, I, think I would I think, think working. I think keep working. I mean, um, you know, as I said to a friend, I, I, I we were we were writing a script, and I said. Uh, if you if you if you um, expect yourself to be in the headlines and you have to expect yourself to be fish wrapping the next day, <laughs> and um, that's just the fact of the matter is you have to take the down with the up, and if you can't, you're fucked. I mean, and if yeah. you buy your own PR, if you look in the newspaper and believe that's you, then you're John Belushi. You know, you're somebody that yeah. um, is trying to live up to. You, you become a Macy's Day parade float of yourself and that's when you die so, so true but i mean I, 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 whatever okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna come at you john from my perspective okay just think of it from me i don't know anything blah 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 you are iconic you are a, a character in so much of my upbringing so much of what i held dear to myself um the second Angelo told me that you were going to be on the show, I got on the phone with my sisters, my older sisters, and I was like, you're they not going to believe still, who's going to be on. Speak to you? What? What? They still speak to you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because because we've had, we're have we having you on the show, that's why. I'm like, we're going to have John Capellos. And oh, instantly they started rattling off like a hundred things you've done. Like we were big fans. Like you were like, <laughs> the Greek guy, you were the 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 character that like you know stole these scenes. You were. They you have were... to send the money directly to me. From me. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, John, I've never seen. What I say to my I've family, never... it's a personal residual check. <laughs> you know, uh, John, I've never seen Adi this talkative in one of our interviews. That's what I'm, I'm going no, back. Yeah, they, Adi, this is. This is I, I mean, I'm happy that you're. You know, it, this is great. <laughs> I, I told Angelo, you guys don't even need to be on here. Let me just let me talk to John because I I love this guy. Like it, it's such a big part. Like X Files, Home Improvement, Seinfeld, Sixteen Candles, Weird Side. Like these are like you can't define me without talking about these shows and movies. And you were part of those. You were connected to those. To me, that's amazing. And then you talk about your your sister and your brother, uh, your family, your siblings being like academic, like, okay, but I'm forever. You don't, you have no idea who the hell I am. I forever <laughs> am going to be like honored by like what you've done. Thanks and I will be talking that, that, about you. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> and like and my sister, we, we, we talk about you and your movies, not to mention, and this is like just random, not to mention that one of my best friends, you are the doppelganger. You are the spitting image of his dad. So another reason was like, yeah. we, we were yeah, like, heart condition. <laughs> <laughs> you, you literally are the absolute twin of my best friend's dad. And, well, and, and like, so all these things merged into our, our like lives. And it's like, yeah, well, he could be related to your friend's dad. He's from Boston. His family's from Boston anyway. I mean, he might be. The, the, last, the last name is Politis. I don't know if you're related to a oh, Politis. The Politis. So that bastard owes me 50 euros. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, before... I because... him with Glifada. He was drunk. <laughs> John, I came to... You did a special screening 
during the LAGF, you did this thing through your, uh, I think it's through your production company, Carpuzzi. It was kind of like a talk show with a woman. We, I it came with my wife. Uh, commentary. Commentary. It was great. You guys, you had to see this thing that John uh, produced himself. And it was, uh, I loved it. And we had a full house and we came to see it. And I really liked it. It was... Uh, so, uh, Angelo, are you doing movies now or what? No, I, I mean, I parts here and there. I played some weirdos in a couple of films. I do some stuff. I do yeah. some stuff uh, in the past. Mostly stand up. I heard you're doing the Jim Belushi story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 what happens is that people say I sound just like him. That I sound I, like Jim. I tease, uh, that, uh, I tease you. Yeah. But J Jim Belushi, who I heard his mom's Greek. I know the dads are Al Al Albanian. Well, when you see the movie 16 Candles, when I'm coming out the aisle, she's right there and she stops me and she's actually in the movie for a moment. Mm. Oh, really? So that was J that was Jim and John's mom. Yeah, she was. Uh, she, yeah, Agnes was her name. Right. And she was actually a nice lady. Um, uh, you know, she put up a, with a lot from her boys, apparently. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and her, <clears throat> Jim and John. And her husband, husband. Adam. Um, but I, I know very little about the family, except that uh, I knew I worked with Jim and uh, knew John a bit. I knew Dan Aykroyd a lot more. Oh, yeah, wow. Dan, another fellow Canadian. I haven't seen but, him in years. And, uh, you know, let me ask uh, you, do you when get back to the Blues Brothers in Chicago? That was a wild time. Yeah. Wow. I can imagine. My oh, God. God. You can't. I don't think, he, you know, I, I thought I could imagine and you couldn't. Because no. stuff happened, Ethan, you know, anyway. <laughs> Portobello. Portobello. For another another episode we have to bring back john another episode look we've zipped through an hour with you john and so it's that, been like it's been 10, 10, 10 minutes i gotta get going anyway because <laughs> no but we're gonna go we, we, we're so happy john I'm, I'm really happy thanks for coming on before we let you go though before i didn't we let come you on go, anybody all right <laughs> before we let you go you say I came on here. Like, this is the Me Too time, guys. <laughs> I, don't, I don't roll that way with anybody, not even with Greek boys anymore. Anymore. <laughs> I said anymore. Well, what we're going to do, John, we're going to, before we let you go, and thanks, really, thanks for coming and doing this. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. But how much you're, you're sending me the money on PayPal, right? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Venmo. Uh, Venmo. Angela, Venmo. Angela's going to Venmo it. Venmo. <laughs> and you know, it's funny we do this. You know, you know, it's funny you say that, John. You go, are you, uh, my uncle, are you guys making money from this? No. Why? Why? I go, we're not. We don't even have a sponsor <laughs> yet. Yeah, Angela, Angela, let me just say very quickly, my mother-in-law, my yeah. mother-in-law, you know, mother-in-law. Yeah. I'm oh, like, yeah. We have like this going on. We got that going on. We got this famous actor. We got this. this. I'm like so excited. I'm like bursting. And everybody's like so excited. And my mother in law is like, ¿Qué pasa <laughs> And I'm like, son of a bitch, you ruined everything. <laughs> it's all about the money. Give me a buzzkill. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead and hello. Yeah, so anyway, so before we let you go, John, Forty has just a couple of questions we do with all our guests, and then Ari oh. takes it home. So I'll give it over to Forty now. And uh, Yeah, thank you, Angela. John, this has been an honor, brother. This is such a great time. We definitely would love to have you back at some point whenever, you know, you, you've got time. But uh, Whenever so we you got a check. Whenever you got a check. We get some money. <laughs> Well, if you take crypto, we can send you some cryptocurrency. Oh, yeah. Books, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Me and Elon Musk. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but we like definitely like to, uh, to ask, you know, some really cute questions, I should say, that, to get to know you better for our Greek, uh, Greek audience around the world. First question, John, is... Nine inches. <laughs> That's it. There you go. On to the next Thank question. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Your favorite and least favorite <laughs> Greek food growing up as a kid? Well, liver, liver, anything liver. Oh, my <laughs> liver. My favorite Greek food was spanakopita. Oh, I mean, yeah. not spanakopita, but uh, uh, not spanakopita, uh, but spanakorizo. Spanakorizo, oh, right. Excellent. Popeye right there. Excellent. Um, <laughs> you know, and you mentioned, you know, quite a bit about your mom and your dad and growing up in a Greek household. Any 
sayings that your parents would say to you that stuck to you as a kid growing up that you still remember? Any famous lines or sayings? Uh, my mother used to say to me, are you a Greek god or a goddamn Greek? <laughs> <laughs> and in her Boston accent. I mean, oh, I love it. Are you a Greek god or a goddamn Greek? And Johnny <laughs> Georgie, it was always, John, George, get down from there. Get down from there. Um, there was one thing that my parents would say, and I've been thinking about it recently. My mother would say, okra kekseros. Oh, you know that. that, that kicks familiar. that off. What is it? Uh, 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 um, uh, um, exi kicks that off. Something yeah. exi kicks that off. I think that's it. Yeah, six and, and dry. Right. When my mother was really, really pissed off, she would go stravox on it, blind them. Is that yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. Like when I heard that one, it was taught, it started, it sounded totally, totally biblical. Um, my father was a fancy. He had a lot of sayings. Father, um, I'm I'm sure we can we can definitely bring those out in, in another segment for sure. Sorry, that's it. I'm but uh, but as Greeks, John, you know, <laughs> we're definitely as a culture, we're definitely superstitious. Any superstition that you still maybe live by as a Greek? Do so, do so, do so. Yeah, that's yeah, a classic. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, any superstition? Not really. Do you have any ritual like before an audition or something? No, I try not. To, I try to avoid that. I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I agree with you with that. My only ritual is preparation. Yeah. It's nice. Well, great. When I, when I do, I mean, I did a play last year and I know myself like if I'm about to go on stage, I can be my own worst enemy. And I say to myself, if I know it, well, you know it. If you know it, you know it. Nice. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for, for that time. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. And um, despite the fact that Ange was part of this, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we want, we, want, we want everybody out there watching, listening. Uh, this is going to be live tomorrow, video, podcast, everywhere. You could listen to podcasts, everywhere you can watch videos on the app. I personally want to say an absolute pleasure mr john capellos somebody who is like part of like I, I i consider you part of my life because like so many aspects of my growing up have involved you in some way or another you are you are the first greek guy i ever saw like to be famous and to like bring greek into the mainstream your, your characters were amazing every step of the way. You're a scene, uh, a scene stealer. You are just, you're awesome. And that comes straight from my heart. And Angelo could vouch for me because he heard me. I was like freaking out. An honor to meet you. An honor yeah. to have you on the show. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. You've made, and, you've made my day and my week. And you've, <laughs> You've and given me enough uh, ego boost for a long time. <laughs> please, please come back on the show. Please give us more stories. We love every single minute of it. If you're ever in D.C. or Boston, let us know. We have a big Greek family that is going to take care of you. <laughs> we're going to feed you. We're going we're gonna to revel uh, in your stories. So. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, everybody out there for watching Love and listening. Thank you to Foti. Thank you to Angelo. As always, Angelo, you nailed it with this guest. Like, amazing. Thanks, John, for coming on. Thanks, and John. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Great. John, John Capellos, the bohunk. We are honored to have you with us. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, gentlemen. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.